Hi everyone, welcome to this M2D2, M2D2 talk. Uh, our speaker today is William Michael Kendall, and in this presentation, he will be discussing his work on fragment based rediscovery via unsupervised learning of fragment protein complexes. William is a PhD student at the University of uh, Cambridge under Professor Alpaldi. His research focused on the application of machine learning to accelerate the design make test cycle of drug discovery. And previous work has spanned here to lead discovery of SARS CoV 2 MP error uh, inhibitors, and as well as um, the quantitative interpretation of reaction yield models. He was also previously a research intern at DeepMind working on extension of alpha two, of alpha fold. Thank you so much, William, for um, presenting your work here with us today and uh, looking forward to the talk. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, as Spudencio mentions, I'm a, finishing my PhD under Dr. Alpha Lee at Cambridge, looking at basically how machine learning can accelerate parts of drug discovery. And today I'll be discussing this particular work that is now on BioArchive which is about unsupervised learning of fragment protein complexes. So kind of this approach, this is the main focus of today is discussing how is this combination of machine learning and pharmacophore modeling and kind of fragment-based drug design. And I realized the audience today might not be very super familiar with all of these, like a mixture of machine learning and drug design. So I'll start with an introduction to both of these topics. And then once we understand what these concepts are, then I think you can understand the approach that we're doing, which is called Fresco. And once I describe it, then we can discuss some retrospective and prospective results. So at any point, we feel free to stop and raise your hand or put some questions in the chat. And I'll be happy to pause and make sure everything's clear before we move on. Okay? So let's start with fragment. So I've you've seen this term in the title. I mentioned it once or twice. What people in drug discovery mean by a fragment are these very small molecules. So if you've heard of the rule of five, the Lipinski's rule of five, that, this, that rule of five describes a drug-like molecule. And this, we have a similar thing for fragments called the rule of three. And this is even more strict. That these are much smaller, they're much less complicated than a drug-like compound. So kind of this graph on the right-hand side kind of describes in abstract terms the difference in space occupied by a fragment and something you consider a drug. So kind of that's intentional that you have very small molecules that do not bind very well to anything. Um, these are what some of these look like. If you kind of, in terms of the chemistry, the chemical structures, these are very small, right? These are not very complicated. And if you think about all possible fragments, this is a much smaller space than all po possible drug-like compounds. And that, that's, you'll see why this is a good thing. The, the reason is we can use this in drug design. If, if you think about the traditional approach, that you have some protein, you have a binding site, and you want something to go into the binding site for whatever reason. The kind of traditional approach is you test things that are drug -like. That's why we have the rule of five to filter things. You try lots of these very big molecules and hopefully you find something that binds and then you can start optimizing it. The problem is that the search space is so big for drug-like compounds that you can test a thousand compounds and get nothing. It's just sometimes it can be unlucky. Instead, if you go to fragments, the space is so much smaller and it's also you know, arguably cheaper. Things are, it's, it's just an easier sampling of the space. It's, you get a higher hit rate. And the, the, but what, instead you get these very small molecules that bind to only a small part of the binding site. So it's, instead of one molecule binding everything, you have a few small ones in different parts. And then you, have, then you have the problem of how you convert this kind of set of compounds into something that's useful. 
that this whole strategy is a very different way of thinking about drug design. And it's not super new, so maybe 20 years old now. Uh, but there are companies who only do fragment based drug design, very successfully. So how you go from fragments to a drug, there are a few strategies. So here are the most well-known ones. So if you have one fragment, you can try to grow it. You extend the structure towards a part that has never seen. Um, this is a bit difficult. The most, uh, the more better well-known ones are fragment linking or fragment merging. And both of these, essentially, you have two fragments that are near each other and you try to connect them somehow. So if they're a bit far, then you have some uh, linker, we call it, you connect the two and then you have one bigger molecule or if you have two molecules that overlap, then you can literally replace the overlap parts and now you have hopefully a good compound. There have been many successful examples in the, in the literature. There are now drugs in the clinic that are you know, based on this. And you know, here are some examples. The red and blue are two separate fragments. And when you connect them, you can see from the, the IC50 that the binding affinity is improved by a lot and that this is a case of merging. And down here, the second example is one of linking. So this sounds pretty good, right? The, you just need to link stuff and merge things. And this is something machine learning has been useful for. There, there, there's been some work in this area already, essentially in terms of generative modeling. So they're models called, called the linker and Sinterlinker that are essentially quite straightforward. You have two fragments and it learns to generate some potential uh, so places the atoms so that this thing is uh, stable. It's a good molecule. Um, in this, this case is quite naive, unconditional sampling. And here you can condition the structures based on, uh, you want this, you want to have an aromatic ring in this place that they will, the, you, you condition the generation towards that. So this is a very useful thing that machine learning can do. I will say the drawback is someone still needs to decide which fragments you want to link. And then after you generate you know, 10,000 samples, someone still needs to decide which of those you want to actually go forward with. Um, but this is very promising already. And I think more people should work on this. This is very super interesting stuff. Um, so does that mean, you know, is, is fragment-based drug discovery, does that solve everything? Is it, it sounds very simple. And obviously if I ask that, the answer is no. Uh, fragment merging, fragment-based drug design is very hard. So in physics terms, you want the binding of the linked compound, that's the thing on the right. You want this to have a better binding than these two compounds on the right. So you measure this, this delta delta G number, and there's this really nice paper in JCTC looking at the physics of the binding. And I quote from it, the vast majority of fragment linkages have a delta delta G that's close to zero, or it's even worse. So this doesn't always work. It's not that you take two fragments, you merge it like Lego, you go home. No, it's not. It's very difficult. And part of the difficulty is because of the flexibility of molecules. The entropy of the binding affects lots of things. And part of, and it's difficult to see it from the structures. So I think, especially like we don't um, appreciate this enough that the structures that we see, they're not the ground truth almost. They, they can change, things can change. That's a very clear example in this figure where the red structure is at room temperature and the blue structure is in the crystal at the crowd, like a very low temperature. And most data that we get is at a low temperature. In this comparison, the molecule completely changes 180 degrees. Now, if you can see this, the green atom here, in the two structures, it goes, the whole molecule flips to the other side. And that, that's the kind of dramatic change that structures can have. And if you're just relying on structures, you can get really uh, frustrated. You can get, you can get tricked. And this is particularly bad for fragments because they're so small and their binding is so weak. You can get structures, but sometimes they're not honest or you, you merge them and it turns out you don't get what you expect. So we cannot fully rely on these structures. 
either, even, if, even for an expert, they will find it difficult. So these two things kind of motivate the, the approach that we're going towards. So first of all, deciding what fragments to merge. If, if I give you a bunch of fragments, what do you do? It's, it's not so, right? Someone at the moment, this is done by experts. But there's no automated pipeline for doing this. And even for these experts, this the, the very traditional way of looking at the pair of molecules or pair of fragments and trying to merge them, it's unreliable because each structure on their own is you, you're not sure how much you can trust it. And yeah, so vaguely, maybe we want to can we use multiple structures to improve our confidence and do everything automated. So that's what I'm going to describe today with Fresco. So if you see this, this graphic at the top, that's the traditional approach where someone, some human expert, takes a pair of fragments and links them. Instead, instead of thinking about these fragments one by one, well, as a pair, the approach we're taking is to you go with the distributional approach. We take all of the structures all together, all the different fragments, and we treat it as, an, as a distribution that we want to learn. That this is a sampling of some ground underlying ground truth distribution, in particular, distribution of pharmacophores. I'll get to what they are. But the, the conceptually, once if we can estimate this distribution well, then we can actually take compounds and find compounds that fit the distribution. And then that is a different way of screening compounds. It's a very different way of doing drug discovery. And then in this way, you don't need to pick two molecules to, to, to merge. You just use all of the data, you have a hundred of them, and you just learn the distribution and it's all automate. It's all data driven. So let me now introduce what the pharmacophore is. So a pharmacophore is basically, it's an abstract, it's an abstraction of a molecule. So instead of thinking about the exact atom type, the exact connectivity of the molecular graph, I can instead say, in the very rough terms, this compound is, has two aromatic groups. And in the middle, there is the hydrogen bond donor. There's some hydrogen bond acceptors in the middle, as well as the left and right. And then I have this fuzzy description of the molecule. This is a very useful way of course graining chemical space. It's like you take off your glasses and instead of the seeing everything in super high resolution, you get the fuzzy uh, like electron cloud. Kind of. you, see, you see this fuzzy ball of what this molecule is. And this is a good thing because it makes extrapolation a bit easier. Instead of worrying about the exact graph type, is this something the molecule, uh, the, the, your machine learning model has seen? Instead, if you take another molecule, you don't care about the graph, if the aromatic groups, the donor acceptor groups, and the charge groups, if they're in the same similar place, then you know it's a similar molecule and hopefully you'll have similar binding. This is not a new idea. The, this concept of pharmacophore modeling is very old. It has been in use for a long time. And these pharmacophores, you would obtain them, for example, by observing the structure. If you have some drug, you have some compound bound to your protein, then you have their software tools. You, someone can look at the physical structure and see, oh, this oxygen atom is near an amino acid. And then you can put the hydrogen bond on your pharmacophore there. Alternatively, if you do not have the structure, you can take, and instead you have some ligands that you know interact. You can look at the conformers. You can look at the, the three-dimensional shape of these molecules, align them, overlap them. And I suspect if you look, if you take your, your data set and you do this, you will see a lot of them overlap, that there will be some kind of interaction that is in common with all of them. And if, if you can get this information, this correlation between the structures and use that to do screening. So yeah, as I, as I mentioned, you, you get your pharmacophores, and you can take a new data set. You have some database of compounds you can buy or stuff that's available to you. 
And you can check, do these molecules have a pharmacophore that's similar to the ones I observed in the data, in the structured data in my ligands? And you can throw away the ones that do not match, and you can choose to make test the ones that do match. That you know, probably, this is a much higher probability that it will be able to bind to the same amino acids to fit into the binding site, and so on. That this pharmacobase screening is, is actually used a lot. It's, it's very common. There's lot of companies to sell software for doing this. Um, this is a useful, handy tool. And I think it's a bit surprising. There's very little machine learning work on this, I would say. I mean, it, it's not, I've seen very little in the literature about it, but it seems very useful to me. And it's people who do drug design will know what the pharmacophore is. So I think this, there's a lot of room there for, for work. Um, but that's kind of the introduction to what pharmacophore modeling is. And that if you come back to fragments, and kind of what I'm trying to do, if we take fragments and we convert all of the structures, benzene rings, pyrroles, we turn them all into donors, acceptors, aromatic groups, charge groups, what you will get is something like this graphic on the left. You will see that each of these dots will be from a different molecule, and you will see some of them is a very strong, dense interaction. A lot of the donor groups are in the same place, they like aromatic groups, they're doing some stacking, they're interacting with the protein. And you also see a few data points that are just in, in, the, in the air. They're not doing anything. It's, it's kind of in, by themselves. And if we look at this as a distribution, I mean, this is kind of an extension of pharmacophore modeling that we can, again, we can look for molecules that match the distribution. And the difference is, we want to match where the interactions are strong, where we see a lot of data points, that multiple different molecules, they all interact in the same place. And we can ignore these outliers. So we, we can, um, this gives us confidence, whereas instead of the individual structures, which we cannot fully trust, if you have 12, 20 structures all in the same place, they all have the same, uh, pharmacophores in the same place, then that is, a, we can have much more statistical significance. We can have much more confidence that this is a real interaction that if you construct a molecule that has these pharmacophores, it will actually work. We won't have failures. And, oh, yes. I'm curious, how do you represent the distribution of, of pharmacophores, especially in that case, I think like the red, point kind of is rather a multimodal distribution. So I'm afraid that you use a unimodal distribution to represent that. So how do you represent that? Yeah, so, so each of these points will have a coordinate. So this is a distribution of point, it's a point cloud, I guess you can think of that. Um, and I will get to that there are, multi, there are multiple ways of modeling a point cloud, right? So I chose, I have a particular choice, but I'm sure other choices will work and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, there's, I see a question in the chat about, as well about fragments being promiscuous. So this is essentially saying that fragments can bind to multiple things at the same time. And that's not something I take into account in this work. So it, as you'll see, I only focused on single targets and that's an interesting thing to consider if we consider if we start doing multi-target kind of things, uh, but in not in this work, no. Hope oh, that answers your question. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the this distribution learning will not work if there's not enough data. If there's only ten data points, there's not you. You're kind of wasting your own time. So there's a valid question: Is there enough data to do this? And that is the thing that is new. So obtaining, you can get a lot of structures now because of technology in the past three, four, five years. For in this particular example for MAC1, which is a protein target, a recent screen, you can have a hundred bound structures. Well, I think it's over a hundred in the paper. And each of these molecules contains multiple pharmacophores. So if I 
if you take this, these structures on the left-hand side, you convert each of them into francophores, you get a very dense blob that I would say is rich in information, and that's enough for distribution learning. So kind of it's a preliminary, is it even worth doing this? I would say yes, and we will only get more data as the technology improves. So now I'll, after all this preliminary stuff, what, what am I actually, what is the method? So I will start describing it in more detail now. So we have our collection of fragment protein structures, which I call a fragment ensemble. And I look at them in pairs. That is the traditional way. I look at pairs of fragments and I measure the distance between the pharmacophores. So the two fragments that are in the same place, they'll have a small distance but in different parts of the binding site, they'll be far. And I want to model the from confer distribution in geometrical space. And there are many, you know, once I talk about ge geometry learning, things can get very complicated. As a proof of concept, I'm not doing anything very complicated, I take the lowest order, the simplest one, which is pairwise distances. So for example, I would measure, if I take every possible hydrogen bond donor, except the distance, I measure them within my data set, I would get a histogram like this, a nice flat one-dimensional histogram. And for a different pair of pharmacophores, if I do aromatic, aromatic distance, I get a different set. So for each pair of pharmacophores, I get a, a distribution of distance pairwise. And that's a one-dimensional one histogram. And I can fit a curve to this histogram. In this case, kernel density estimation I can actually learn the probability density of a pair of pharmacophores having a particular distance. I can say that a donor acceptor pair being eight angstroms apart is much more likely than being six angstroms. That is something that, that's, on the, well, I can see that by eye, but an unsupervised learning model, curve fitting literally, can I quantify the difference in probability density for those two different data points. I can actually do this numerically. What this then allows us to do is, once I have this fitted curve, is that I can score molecules I've never seen. If I take this molecule, for example, and I see, ah, it had, this has a donor acceptor pair that's 12 angstroms apart, 8.2, 7.8, I see that this is a high probability density, that this is, you know, this, fits into the distribution that I have observed from the experimental structure. Whereas if I have another molecule, and, oh, it turns out it has a distance of four, then I know this is, this is a low probability distribution, uh, low probability molecule, and I can, I can rank them. I can say, don't, this one's not going to work, and instead this one will work. In other words, by observing fragment protein structures, and using this pharmacophore modeling technique, I have a scoring model at the end. This model looks at a bunch of structures, where the donors are, where the aromatic groups are, and I can put in a new molecule and it gives me a number. And the number, well, in theory, it should correlate with whether or not the molecule is, has a good binding. This is kind of the, the whole concept of this. So, that's the origin of the term, fragment ensemble scoring. And that's the acronym Fresco, that this is the scoring model. I can do a fragment screen, I get a bunch of structures. I just construct this model, totally data-driven. I don't set, there are no hyperparameters. I guess maybe I choose which pharmacophores to model, but I don't, I never didn't really touch them. The donor acceptors, those are very, those are very old concepts. And it is use, using that, it decides, it can give me numbers for different molecules. Okay. So this, this sounds nice. Does it actually work? So I'll show you some results now from a retrospective computational study. So this is using data from COVID moonshots. And this is the reason I choose this data, or this data set rather, is that this is specifically a fragment based drug discovery campaign. This data is, this campaign is, for designing molecules against the main protease, which is a 
protein target for the coronavirus, COVID-19. And all of this, this is totally fragment-based like this. So this is the most um, in domain. This is like the correct kind of data set to use. Just other data sets we found are, well, fragment-based drug design data sets are usually non-public. Um, so that's why we chose this. And there's a lot of data to as well. That's another good reason to do this. All the data is public. There's a lot of compounds that got assayed. There's a lot of structures. All of this uh, submitted designs by people. It's all there. And if we're using this data set, we would check if we use Fresco, would we have accelerated the hit discovery. So in the very early stages, with fragments, no data, no ligand fire activity. It's, you, haven't, you cannot use even a random forest. There's no data to fit. There's no Y value. Can we, in this early stage, can we actually accelerate the discovery of new compounds? So to do this uh, study, I trained my Fresco model on the fragment protein structures. Now, in this case, I had 23 structures, which is not very much, but still, that's a good number. But in industry, this is like a typical number that you can get up to 100. And once I have this model, I rank the compounds in the data set. So I'm looking at the early stage, I rescore all of the compounds and I see, does this have a high score? Does this have a low score? And I sort the list. And I look at the top, uh, at the top 10% of the list, the top 100, and I see how many of these are actually good compounds. This is about a, a thousand data points. And that's, this is the graph here. That's the hit rates. So that's what percentage of say the top 20, what percentage of this has less than five SD50? So this is the measure of the binding affinity. Now the, the dotted line here, that's the baseline hit rate. So if you sample randomly from the data set, what can you get? So, but that's about 6%. And this is the hit rate from expert humans. So the, the, this is not some random data set of randomly screening compounds by robots. These are every single compound here is chosen by a human being, uh, the expert chemist. So it's very difficult to do this. Um, and the surprising thing, first of all, is my the curve from the Fresco model is above the random. This is this is not easy, right? I think we have to appreciate this. Um, this model that has only observed structures, it's a relatively simple model. It is has is correlating binding affinity somehow. And the red curve, that's from doing docking. So that's a physics-based simulation method. It's not the best method, I know, but as a comparison, it is at least as good. I mean, in this case, it seems a bit better. But like that, this, these are very promising results. Now, if I change the timing of the of the data set, so if I include more and more compounds from later in the campaign, so essentially at the beginning, we're just looking for compounds that work. And at some point, we found a good compound and they're optimizing it. So this the, the nature, the distribution of the molecules becomes a bit different. So it's this kind of the same structure with small changes. And here you can see the docking, the simulation-based method becomes getting better and better and as more data arrives. So that's kind of a sanity check. Um, so, so I would not say that Fresco is better than docking. It's definitely, um, like that. I'm not making that claim. I'm not saying we should stop docking things, but it's more, the point is more that Fresco actually has a signal. This is very uh, exciting. I just see structures and I have something that outputs a signal that is related to binding affinity, which is pretty good. Okay, so, and it, it's difficult to benchmark this because this is a model that does not learn act bioactivity. This, there is no Y values to, to train on. Uh, with fragments, you usually don't. So I cannot benchmark this against a graph neural network. So this is the kind of <laughs> maybe a bit odd study, but this is, we, we can, something else. Yeah, sorry, Prudentia, you have your hand up. Yes. I was wondering if you have some result where you com 
you kind of measure the number of complex that you need to initially get to this reason. Like if the number of complex were to change, like at which point you have enough or don't have enough complexes to to be able to generate this type of uh, improvement. Uh, so we, we didn't do kind of an ablation on this, but, but it's an interesting point, uh, kind of the diversity, I guess, of structures. Um, it's a good question. I think. <laughs> Here we have 23, which is a very typical number. Um, I suspect, I'd be surprised if you, if 10 structures is just as good. I think the more structures, the better. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good question. Yeah, okay. So do I account for ligand flexibility? So the, what the, the, on accounting for confirmations in this histogram, I do account for multiple structures of the same fragment, which I get, I do get sometimes, not always. So that is accounted for that if I have duplicate confirmers from like two different um, crystal, crystal models for, for, for the same electron density, uh, then I would weigh that by half each to make sure I'm not double counting. For ligand flexibility, yes. So in this, sorry, in this study, the scores, like for example, with docking, multiple confirmations are generated because these are generated con confirmations. Uh, and we choose the best one for that. Uh, we didn't do any kind of exponential weighting. Um, I'm not super expert in that, but we kind of, we had a look and it seemed to make sense to us. So that, that was an answer to a question in the chat from Martin. Okay, yes, Jonathan, you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I have a similar question, so I figured I'd ask it now. Um, I'm very interested in how you would account for protein flexibility. So you've got, let's say, you know, 23 confirmations here. And if you're looking at where uh, the fragments are sort of bound to that confirmation and then pairwise distances between multiple different pharmacophores and multiple different fragments, if in a worst case scenario, you know, the protein has a lot of flexibility and is moving around, you could have, you know, five, 10 angstroms of, of difference between what those pairwise distances could be between very similar pharmacophores. So in, in a worst case scenario, that could totally wash out your signal. Obviously that's not happening, but, you know, have you, have you thought about ways of, of creating, you know, motion-based reference frames or something so that that signal is more, um, uh, uh, stable as, as these, um, confirmations are flexible. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that would make things very difficult. That's true about defining reference for things. Um, in that sense, that's kind of, that was partly why we went for a distance-based approach. Cause if you start doing absolute coordinates, which I'm, I suspect if you go with a deep learning based approach, that's what you input in that makes things very complicated. We deal with frames. Um, but even still, if distances instead, that makes things very difficult. Um, I don't account for that, obviously. Uh, I yeah, Trying to have multiple protein models, uh, trying to weigh those somehow, those, those are the things I would try. But, but yeah, the cryptic uh, binding pockets are hard. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I think that's all the questions so far. So yeah, these are kind of relatively, I would say flimsy retrospective results. Like on this on its own doesn't really convince anyone, I would say. You need a bit more. Uh, and it's it's hard because there's, there's not that many retrospective data sets that we can do this on. So to kind of address this because went, we went on the perspective screen to see, does this actually work? So we went for two different targets. So MPRO, as I mentioned, this has 23 structures. And you also looked at MAC1, which is from before the one with loads of fragments. And these are both antiviral targets for, for making compounds against the coronavirus. There's a good mechanism, there's good reasons for targeting these two, I won't go into it. Um, to actually, do a screening, we need a bit more complicated, we need something more complex than just the model. 
So this is, the, I'll describe the workflow for this. So first of all, we kind of have our fragment structures and we also screen enemy real. So this is a very large database of compounds that you can buy. And at the time we did it, it was just a billion, or at least we had a billion customers. Nowadays it's like 12 billion. Um, but we took these compounds and we pre-computed all of the features for this. So we took every single molecule there, we turned them all into pharmacophores, and we screened them with Fresco. So for each target, we'd have a Fresco model for M-Pro, a Fresco model for Mac one and we would calculate, we'd rank <laughs> this a billion compounds. And we would take the top 10,000, do a bit of filtering, and basically there's a lot going on here in terms of the filtering clustering, but essentially we arrived at, for each target, we would order 40 to 50 compounds and just see what we get, just to see if anything makes sense at all. This was what we did. There's a lot of things that are not perfect about this, not optimized at all. Um, this is what we did. That's how we went on the perfective screen. So for MPRO, these are the kind of compounds that Fresco likes. And from a pharmacophore perspective, very, very coarse grains here. It's kind of two aromatic groups with an amide isosteer, so amide-ish kind of functional group in the middle. This is being very hand wavy. And does this make sense? Well, if we look at the fragment hits for MPRO, there are a few fragments that are like this. And there are more fragments that are kind of one half of the aromatic group would be, so that you kind of see on the, I've illustrated here that you have two main, the fragments tend to be in two places. It's like in the left and the right. And these three fragments that I've drawn, they're the ones bridging between them. So in that sense, this is kind of what we want it to do. It's designing slightly bigger compounds that are kind of merging or linking the pharmacophores in the, in the two pockets, I guess, of the, of the binding site. So irrespective, Already, this makes sense. This is good. We actually synthesized these and tested them. And one of these is a decent binder. Um, so there are some of them that are a bit weaker. Some of them are not active at all. That's just how it was. So we have this compound that's slightly active. And we did a follow-up. So we checked to make sure this is not a false positive. This is not some weird impurity causing the result. So we made some changes to the structure checked that there's still activity. You see there's some changes there and we make some other changes and the activity drops by a lot. So we don't, I mean, obviously we hope that it would go up, but this is good news in that the activity is consistent across small changes in the structure. So this is confirmed, not a false positive. For Mac one it's a similar story. So here it's well, it's a very different type of compound. It's not randomly choosing hit compounds that are, are rather very functional, uh, promiscuous compounds. These are, it's choosing things that make sense, that are different depending on the protein target. And here we see kind of a heterocyclic, particular heterocyclic motif, and it's near hydrogens on donor acceptor pair somewhere in the vicinity. And this is interesting because the natural substrate is adenosine. And you can definitely see. A lot of these are very adenosine-y and that, that, that's really amazing to me. That this model that looks at distribution histograms of uh, pharmacophore distances looks through a billion compounds and it finds a natural substrate. I think that's amazing. To be fair, some of the fragments do have, are, are similar. So it's identifying, it's definitely finding that again, it's, it's a really, it's a high peak in the probability density. Um, but this is, I think four fragments out of a hundred are like this. So the rest are very different, um, but still this is sensical. This is consistent. It's kind of what we expect it to do, which is good. And for this, we had a bit more compound, uh, we synthesized a bit more. The activity is not as strong, but it's different protein. The, and make a direct comparison, but there is some activity. And we actually have crystalline structures for these. So this compound is, has a structure, a few more that also do have structures, but are much lower in activity. And if I overlay this with the form before, so in the fragmented, uh, it's a bit hard to see, but 
things line up to where they expect. You know, it's in a, this is the identity in scaffold. And you can see the aromatic group is in the right place. The donor is very clustered with the rest of the donors. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is as expected. And as before, we also change the structure a bit to see if the activity has any improvement, decrease. And we see there is, it is robust. Uh, there's a clear structure activity relationship here. Like have this is confirmed. This is not some random fluke. This is a real compound that does bind. Um, it non-covalently. It's not some weird aggregator. So, kind of to kind of summarize here, wrapping up. I don't want to go over time. These are promising results for a very different way of doing family-based product design. And I, I want to be clear, I'm not claiming any state of the art here. This is the, the compounds I showed you are not great at all. And, and no, no one should be taking them if they have COVID. If you want good studies on making MPRO and MAC1 inhibitors, check out these two that are um, in particular are chosen because they are very large screens, ultra, ultra large screening, docking this PNAS paper, also does a bit of fragment stuff. You should check them out. Be able to go further into that area. I think the data is very interesting for doing machine learning as well for anyone who's more in that discipline. I will say that kind of what I'm showing, the point of what I showed you is that this is a prospective validation. Um, I could have just stopped. I, this is a cool idea. There's some evidence, you know, full stop. Um, prospectively, buying compounds and testing that they work. The seeing the behavior when you use it as it's intended to be used, I think that's very important. And we should do this more often with any kind of machine learning model. Um, so that's meant to be clear. That is why I'm sharing those, those uh, compounds, those activity results. And kind of the outlook for this, you know, there are obviously lots of ways to improve this. It's not optimized in any way. Learning distributions, just the geometry, there's, there's so much maths you can do. Think about end body in interactions, um, about frames, as, as Jonathan mentioned, about the flexibility, protein flexibility. Um, the screening workflow is there, there's a lot of ad hoc choices there what to filter, what databases to even search. Maybe I should have searched in a smaller database and invested more uh, computational power on generating good predictions, including structures beyond fragments. That's not something I'm looking into. And of course, deep learning. Deep geometry learning, dis distribution learning, generative modeling. This is very much what we know it can already do. Um, but I, I intentionally didn't do it, but this is kind of a simple baseline. Does this prove the fact that you can go from structure to binding affinity it, that that not that hasn't that hasn't yet been established. So I feel like this has established that. And you know, if a small, if, if a relatively simple approach can do it, a neural network should be able to. And then you can do lots of tricks on conditioning on different sequences, different targets. Um, there's a lot of fun you can do on geometry based encodings. And I think the general theme I want to more broadly uh, touch on is that there's a lot of cool problems in fragment-based drug discovery that hasn't really been, um, machine learning hasn't really touched on so far. Uh, and th there's a lot of exciting opportunities there, I feel like. Pharmacophores are underutilized. They're very good coarse-grained feature, for if you, especially when in a low data situation. I think it's, as you can see here, I don't have that much data, but you can get a lot, squeeze a lot out of it if you coarse grain. And it's a very general uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of idea that instead of very single structure-based things that you can exploiting correlations explicitly from multiple structures instead of treating them on their own, uh, that there is room there for actually making more out of the limited data that we can get. And that goes for the multiple structures with the same ligands, going correlations between different different molecules going between different protein, not different structures of the same protein, let alone different proteins. Uh, being more explicit about correlations, uh, I think there's a performance improvement there for whatever your application. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the overall summary here. This is a very novel approach to doing drug discovery. 
uh, you can check out the preprint of our archive dealing with reviewers at the moment. Um, this is, yeah, this is kind of a, I would say promising. There's a lot of scope for improvement. And I think this opens the door to a lot of interesting research. So yeah, I couldn't have done this without a lot of experimental collaborators, testing confounds, getting structures from the UCSF, from the Weizmann Institute, from Oxford, uh, the data from the COVID moonshot team, obviously that was a big part of this. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. Perfect. Thank you so much for the for the great presentation, William. Um, if you have any question, please just raise your hand, open your mic, and uh, yeah, ask a question. But maybe okay. you can start with the question in the in the chat by the class. Okay. Yeah. So I see. So there are a couple of questions in the chat to answer first. So there's something about false positives. So yeah, I guess you could say a lot of the compounds that the model has chosen. So stuff like this, none, none of these things bound very well. So I went to make, we, we made 38 compounds and this is the best one. I think there's another one that was maybe 70 ish micromolar, but the rest were, I would say false positives. Yeah, this is not a good hit rate at all. Um, but you know, it's actually, it's somewhat working. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this, is, so this is, and I wouldn't have known this, right? If I just looked at this curve, I would have thought this is great. Everyone should use it, blah, blah, blah. No, I, I'm very honest about this, that I suspect a lot of so-called state-of-the-art models, they would also struggle, it's very hard. And it's more than just the model at this point, how you decide to implement it, what molecules do you search? How do you make the decision? Um, those factors, this, this hit rate is represents all of that, not just the model. Um, but I think that's a more realistic uh, number for, 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 for measure comparing progress, or comparing results between different models and how you use it. And you know, if your model is very expensive, you can't afford to screen a billion compounds. That's reflected in this number because then you need a different approach. And I think that's, yeah. Um, yeah, how fast is the model? This model is super fast because the model, if you, if you generate the histogram in Seaborn and you ask it to fit the curve, that's what the model is. This is super fast. I run this on CPU. I, I screened a billion compounds in uh, half a day, I don't know, a day. That's the, that's the rate, that's the speed. Okay, I mean, it's in multiple CPUs, but CPUs are so cheap. And this is a purely CPU-based approach. Um, that, yeah, because, okay, the pre-processing of pharmacophores can be expensive. That's constant time for every molecule. Um, but if you pre-process the features, then running the ball is actually extremely quick. Yeah. And there's a question about going in reverse, taking ligands and screening for structures. Um, I think at best, I mean, I didn't try this. You can, something like this, you can probably generate binding sites, but getting the full protein that would have this binding site, you would have to use more bioinformatics tools, I think, from the protein community. Um, there's some cool protein design work that can generate. So you could have that as like um, asking the generation of a scaffold around the binding site. Uh, I would be surprised if it works well. This is very crude and it's very difficult to design structures in, in reverse in that way. Uh, there's a question on how I actually obtain fragments. Yeah, so let me go back to one of the beginning. So this figure I have here for like examples of, live, uh, of fragments, this is from a catalog of a commercial of a chemical company, and they you they you could buy a set of fragments from these companies. So usually four or five thousand, no, sometimes ten thousand. Sometimes it's proprietary. Uh, you you don't even fully know what's in there until you sign the contract with them. Uh, but you these fragments are, and obviously there are public ones as well. That you you 
me. With the rule of three, you can make your own. Uh, but then, then the question is, which fragments do you test, right? And you, you want to choose, you want to make the most out of each compound. And there's a lot of expertise that goes into getting, using a thousand fragments and getting much more information than screening 10,000 bad fragments. So there's, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, but yeah, these are real, you get them from like people doing the discovery, we get fragment libraries either from uh, what do you call them, chemical suppliers or if, or they would have their own in-house sets of fragments that they deliver good. Yeah, hope that answers your question. I have one question about the, uh, when you come back to the result, comparing the docking to, to your method, Sure. The docking performance were kind of feed rate were increasing as you increase the, the percentage of uh, the library screen. Mm -hmm. While yeah, yeah, those yeah. were kind of uh, yeah, decreasing. So I was wondering, at least most cases, yours is, is decreasing. And I was wondering if there's just the, the high number of uh, false positive rate of docking is explaining that or is there something else uh, explaining this? Uh, yeah, so the in each, um, what do you call it? The, the, in, in each data set, the number of data points is changing a lot. So here is about 970. Here is close to this above thousands. Here is 1,500. The data sets are getting quite different and the distributions are changing. It's not the, the same data set, but I sample more. Because these are human, there's humans involved in the data in, in generating the data. Um, as time goes on, they're making better and better molecules because they have better data. They, they can look back in time. And you can see that from the dotted line. The dotted line is getting much higher. So here, after, I mean, this is a full year, 2021. This is 2020. Um, the percentage of good compounds in the data set is 20%. You, you can have a monkey pick molecules and you can fill 20% of the time they're picking good molecules, right? So it's, it's very difficult I mean, to go above random when it's so enriched, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, so yeah, I mean, sure, it's below the dotted curve, but it's still 15% of the time the molecules are good. Um, compared to here, it's 10%. So the, the distribution is very different. The type of molecules in there are much better than before. Um, and this is, this is a crude way of looking at it. Just, I, I cut off based on time. There, I'm sure there are more clever ways you can think about it. And also for anyone doing benchmarking on uh, predicting bar activities, I think it's worth considering things like this. The, is, does the distribution of data change? Not just in the mathematical terms, but like is, is there some some people had a meeting and we're doing things differently now, and you need to know when that is to make sure you you adapt for the data. Yeah. 